Well, thank you guys for, for leading us in worship. Man, some powerful songs that remind us to, to open our eyes to Jesus, to turn our eyes towards him, to worship him in spirit and truth, just like Brooke and Red um, from God's word. And what an amazing way that we get to celebrate uh, our Savior together this morning as we kind of finish up half a week of school. And so how many for y'all, this was a great week of going back to school? All right, three of y'all, that's awesome. Uh, so how many of y'all didn't get in trouble this week? So yeah, that's probably the, yeah. Yeah, I saw Braden a while ago, came up to me and said, yes, that's good. And so uh, it's, it's one of those weeks where our community is alive with the excitement and the emotions as as students are getting ready to go back to school, as teachers and coaches have been back in school uh, getting ready for this moment. But it's just, it's exciting. Anytime there's something new around the corner, Walmart was excited because you've been spending lots of money on school supplies there. You've been buying Lunchables and juice boxes and all that. So I know Walmart was excited uh, this week. Uh, personally, our church, uh, we had a great week. Uh, we had the opportunity to get to go to, to Little Cypress Elementary and to the junior high and to the intermediate school. We got to, to serve lunch and breakfast. And, and so, so grateful for our team that to help prepare those meals and to get to go and, and just to, to interact a little bit with our teachers and just to say thank you for what you do. And we're so grateful. But even in those moments as we got to, to celebrate with a few, we know that there's so many others out there, other schools that we didn't get to go celebrate and just be excited uh, with them. And I also saw uh, where numerous people got to go and actually walk through and pray for our schools, uh, all of our, our schools here at Little Cypress, I saw a post. And, uh, and so that was amazing that we have the freedom here in our country to get to go walk down the hallways and to pray for our students and our teachers and for all that's come. And for those of you who homeschool, you got to, I know, pray over your homes and excited uh, for what, lies ahead. Um, I know a couple years ago, I got the privilege uh, to teach school for five years at Community Christian School. And so I have a little glimpse into what our teachers go through in preparing uh, for those moments. And I remember there was this great teacher called Harry Wong. And Harry Wong says, you got to be prepared because in the, uh, and it was all about this having procedures in place and being prepared when those kids walk into your classroom so that they know what's going on. And I even heard one of our students, and I said, hey, how was your first day of school? And they came back and said, I had to sit through like six different teachers telling me rules, rules, rules. All these rules of how to, to make the class go perfectly and these expectations of you know what it means to be a cub and a bear and uh, all those things. And uh, obviously our little Cypress uh, mascot, but it takes a lot as we get ready for school and to know what's expected and what it means and kind of what is the goal of education. And at the end of the day, a lot of us, we go to school because we have to, uh, and so you're having to be educated. Uh, but the reality is, for those who, who see the big picture, I mean, education, the goal is to go get your education to prepare you for one day so that you can be successful and have all the knowledge and all the skills and, and what it means to uh, to be not just a student, to, to be successful um, out there in the real world. And so and I couldn't help but think about this morning as we're, you know, for us as a church, it's not back to school for us, but it is kind of this season as we get to enjoy the excitement of our, of our kids and students and parents going back to school. Uh, we do get to, I, I kept thinking about probably for the past couple of weeks, the scripture of the Great Commission kept coming to my line, this my mind, this Matthew uh, 28, and I'm like, and I, I was rationalizing, should we talk about it, is that where we need to go, Lord? I'm like, nah, everybody's heard this, because right, y'all know the Great Commission, you could probably even quote it, because you've heard it so many times, you know, to, to go and to, to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And surely I'm with you always to the very ends of the age. I mean, we know this. We've, we've heard 
this for a long time. And as we think about this, uh, one of my favorite Bible teachers in college was Bob Utley at East Texas Baptist University. And he used to talk about this phrase that words only have meaning in sentences and sentences only have meaning in paragraphs. And so this great commission is in a paragraph that fits in this larger narrative where Matthew is writing his gospel. And so this last chapter of the gospel of Matthew in chapter 28, Matthew is writing and he's sharing in those first few verses about how uh, Jesus rose again on that Sunday morning and the women went to the tomb and they found it empty. And they also met Jesus face to face, not realizing who he was, but they, they encountered the risen Savior. Followed by another paragraph where it's the, the Jewish leaders trying to bribe the Roman soldiers to say it didn't happen, right guys? And they paid it off and even to the point where people believed this story. But, but the truth is, we know that, like we've already sang about today, that we, that we serve and know a risen Savior. And that moment in history changed everything because he once was dead and now he is alive. And then he stands before his followers in this moment here at the very end of Matthew's gospel. And so let's read together uh, these verses, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So we, we see here, like I said, the paragraph. I mean, we know those last few verses, but what happened in front of it? And some of these verses have actually caused some confusion and conflict through the years as people have read that. Uh, but we see these 11 disciples who they go to Galilee and meet Jesus on the mountain. How did they know that that's where Jesus would be? Well, if you flip back a couple of pages, and if you look in chapter 26, verse 20, or chapter 26, verse 32, Jesus said, but after I've risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. So they remembered, they knew where he was going to be. And so, but where it trick, tricks people up is this in verse 17, where it says they worshiped him there, but some of them doubted. These 11 disciples, do you think they doubted Jesus? I mean, they, they had experienced him in the upper room. They had seen him two or three times at this point. They had, you know, Thomas had been able to put his hands in, in the nail scars, and, to, and he, he didn't doubt. I mean, that was that phrase, doubting Thomas. I mean, everybody else had seen Jesus. But one of the things that we, we know as we read all of the different gospel accounts, we see several people, even the women at the tomb, when they got there, they didn't recognize Jesus. Do you think he might have looked different? Yes, there was something different about him. They couldn't, you know, and even last week as we talked about the, the, the road to Emmaus as these two disciples walked with Jesus, they didn't recognize him. They didn't see him for who he really was. The text says that they were kept from seeing, but he still, he, he looked different. And so in this moment here, verse 17, as we're reading about them worshiping and some doubting, uh, we see in Paul's uh, letter to the Corinthian church over in chapter 15 verse 6 it talks about um, that there was 500 that uh, that were with Jesus and so most likely in this particular setting where there's the disciples are all gathering it wasn't just the 11 who were there with uh, with Jesus but possibly this this larger larger group and some of them in a group of 500 if Jesus maybe looked a little bit different they weren't they weren't sure they just they, they kind of they doubted but in this, in this moment, one of the cool things about it is one of the reasons that we know that the text is true is because sometimes things that are said that are hard that we don't quite understand, that doesn't quite make sense. And if you're trying to, to, to say something where you're going to button up everything to where there's no questions, is you would leave stuff out. Like, well, we don't want to make them question. But the reality is some, some doubted in this moment. But we get to this powerful statement here in verse 
uh, 18, where we see um, where we see the word all mentioned three different times. It says when Jesus came to them, it says all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, and they're to go to all the nations. And then at the very end, it says, "Surely I'm with you all ways." Jesus is is all powerful, and in that moment, all authority in heaven and on earth, uh, Jesus had it. He was extending that to his disciples to say, "Hey." Everything I have, I'm giving to you, and you've got this task on hand, and these four commands that we've gone over in Sunday school, in youth Bible study, in big church, as we we call it, uh, we have gone through these commands that Jesus gives us. And the very first one is always our favorite, go. To go, to go. Was it hard to go to school Wednesday morning? No. For some of you, it's like, I can't wait to go. For some of you, your parents are having to drag you down the hall. For some of you, I mean, when you hear that word go, sometimes going is exciting. Sometimes going is, it's against our will. We don't want to. Like this morning when the alarm went off. uh, Some of you are like, man, I don't want to go. Because for whatever reason, you're fighting tiredness. You're fighting other things that are pulling for your attention. But, uh, but sometimes we are excited. We go with all, all force and excitement. And when you think back to, to Abraham in the Bible, uh, you know he was told to go, to go to a place that he would he would he didn't even know about. And so he went, not knowing the the destination. We also with Moses. I mean, so many people are to say, "Hey, to go," not knowing how the story was going uh, to end. Um, in our house, uh, we have uh, three daughters who've gone to college, but this is our last one uh, to get t- to go, and it's it's different. So we're we're going into this thing called empty nester season. Some of y'all have been there, and it's different for us. So although we do have one uh, chicken still in the roost, uh, and we we love her, and so but it's, so it's a little bit kind of a different version of the empty nest for us. But we're but we're going into this to this new season, but. When we hear this word go for us as Christ followers, I mean, we, what does go mean for us? Is it go and share Jesus with your family? Is it go walk across the room and share Jesus with your friend? Is it go walk across your cul-de-sac and, and talk to your neighbor that you didn't want to, to talk to or didn't know how to talk to? I remember a, a guy here named Keith Adams. Some of y'all remember Keith. And he talked about when he moved to Houston. He said uh, what he did is he went out in the middle of his street, set up a table, and took a watermelon and started cutting up the watermelon and sat down in a chair and started eating it. What do y'all think happened? All the neighbors came out to see what is up with this crazy dude sitting in the middle of the street eating a watermelon. And he met all of his neighbors that day, he told me. He said, and some of those neighbors had never met one another. They'd been living there for years. I can't remember how many years he told me, but they had never met one another until Keith goed. He went out into the middle of that street and found there's an opportunity to share the gospel. And that's part of our command. Jesus had lived his life in front of the disciples. He had died on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin. And was raised to newness in life. And now he extends this challenge to all of us, uh, his disciples, his followers, to go. And the good news is verse 18 says he's given us all authority to do it. So we don't have to go in our own strength. Because if we go in our own strength, we're terrified. But because we know God is going to give us the words to say, God is going to be with us, going is not so scary. I grew up in a small town in northeast Texas called Atlanta. Have any of y'all ever driven through Atlanta, Texas? You've been up that way. There's not much there, but a lot of fast food places, a Walmart, a paper mill where my dad uh, worked. But in college, uh, I got on an airplane and went to Chicago. And in going to Chicago, it was me being obedient to go and serve as a summer missionary. Scared me to death. I grew up in a town where, I mean, 
tractors drove on the roads. Cows were plentiful. And now I'm in inner city Chicago. Scared me to death. First thing they did is they gave us a map and said, go into the community, we'll see you in five hours. I'm serious, because they wanted you to go out and just meet people. Just go walk around, get the lay of the land. I was terrified. But going is something that usually gets us out of our comfort zone. It's going to do something we've not done before. Even as y'all went back to school today or this week, going was different because would there be different friends there? Would I like the new teachers? Some of y'all went to different campuses. Some of y'all went to the school for the first time. Even though you had some level of familiarity, there was still something very unfamiliar. But the task that Jesus calls us to do here as we go is that familiar phrase, to make disciples. Make disciples. It doesn't say here to go and make decisions. It doesn't say to go and make people to say yes or sign a card once at church and then they're good. Saying that prayer is not what saves you. Saying a prayer and following Jesus, that's the beginning of a relationship. It's that beginning of a relationship and as you walk in that relationship with Jesus, we see the evidence of what happened in that moment. And so sometimes we can make the decision, the prayer, the card, and we go, I'm in the club. But if there's no difference in you after you met Jesus, then did you really meet Jesus? And sometimes as the church, it's our fault because we, we, we put so much emphasis on not the making of disciples, but the making of decisions. But making the disciple part is walking with someone after they say yes to Jesus and we've dropped the ball. And, it, and it's even, I've heard one commentator made this phrase, it's like we performed a spiritual abortion. It's like this new baby in Christ was conceived and then we let them die because we did not disciple. And so we think about this phrase of going and making disciples. And what's the phrase after that? Of all the nations. Sometimes we think of making disciples as something we go and do off in this other land or like we go and do in Chicago or we go and do somewhere else. But going and making disciples is, it's in our homes. You know, we as moms and dads are the primary disciplers of our kids. And so when your kids graduate church, graduate discipleship with you, you know, what kind of grade did you get? How well did you disciple? And the thing is, our kids don't turn out perfect. We're not perfect. And so our kids are a reflection of us. And, and the other thing too is, as we walk along that way, God is at work and it's this journey. You know, there's days when we do it right, there's days when we do it wrong, but that's what discipleship is. It's growing, it's walking with, it's following. Um, and sometimes when you follow somebody, anyone ever trip? It, it hurts. But you can just lay there because you're too embarrassed to look to see anybody know me. That happened my first year at East Texas Baptist University. Um, I was late for class. Some of y'all have heard this story. Some of you have not. I was late for class. It was history. And I was running. And, and back story. I didn't become a Christian until I was 17 and I had a potty mouth. If you don't know what a potty mouth is, that's awesome. Um, and so, but when Jesus came into me, no one said, hey, Rusty, stop cussing. I just stopped cussing. It was part of Jesus living inside of me. But there were some words filed away in there. And so every once in a while, when you hit your hand with a, with a hammer, some of those words come to the surface. And this day, when I was late for history class at ETBU, one of those words came to the surface. As I tripped on the top step, and, and literally, like you see in the movies where you face plant, books go sliding everywhere. A very uh, strong cuss word came out of my mouth and everybody in the hallway just stopped and looked at me. It was like that. I mean, it just I felt like it was an eternity. So I just picked up my books and went and sat in my class. I'll never forget it. Just, oh. But part of being a follower of Jesus is not always doing it right. Uh, my kids have videoed me doing things dumb and showed it to the youth group. And, uh, you know, and that involves uh, Mallory's car now, but that's for another story. But making disciples, it's, it's a process that we do as we walk with somebody, as we follow Jesus. And as, as the church, it is our job to do that. And as we make disciples, it's, 
It's bigger than coming to this room and hearing a lesson. It's bigger than going to, to our life groups or Wednesday night groups or even reading our Bible every day. Those are times where we self-feed and we grow with one another. But the challenge is, is we want to, is to be intentional with walking in our faith and walking with one another as we make disciples. And so, um, but even as we think about this, making disciples, one of the things that we, we tend to overlook, because we talk about we're the primary disciples in our home, but it's also of all nations. And how, how do we do that? In that term discipleship, evangelism is implied. You can't disciple someone who hasn't heard about Jesus and made a decision to follow him. So it begins with evangelism. But as, they, as we all begin to walk out that relationship uh, with Jesus, it's this, this phrase, we gotta go to the nations. Here's a map up on the screen. Um, and this, I got this from a, a website called the joshuaproject.net. So you can write that down if you're going to go visit this after church. Uh, there's also a link on our church website. If you go to where the, the Bible reading plan is, there's an icon there where you can click on um, praying for the unreached. So as you look at this map, in our world today, there's approximately 8 billion people living on this planet. And of those 8 billion people, there are approximately 17,258 people groups. And people groups are defined as a group of people who share a, a common language, culture, and ethnicity. So you could be a certain people group and not even be living in your country of origin. Because uh, even in our community here in Orange, there are people from the nations that live here, correct? Maybe somebody that lives that's from another nation lives and then you're your neighbor. Maybe you've been into a business and you've seen somebody that doesn't look like you or sound like you, or think like you. The nations are here, but these 17,000 plus people groups, and of them, you can see there in the red area, the red represents 7,217 unreached people groups. So on, the, in, on this planet that we live on, there are approximately 3.4 billion people who are considered unreached. What does unreached mean? Unreached means no one with the gospel of Jesus is evangelizing that culture. That means they will be born and they will die never reading a Bible, never hearing Jesus. And they're going to enter an eternity separated from God, not because they were bad, not because they rejected this message. I mean, we live in a country to where You've heard about Jesus so many times that we become immune or numb to it. And even our, our friends at school, I mean, this week as y'all go back, the cool thing is y'all are missionaries on your campuses. I mean, you get to go tell your friends about Jesus. And so the question is, do you have the courage to go and do it? And then will your friends just reject you? Because they go, eh, I've heard that before. I don't need that. I'd rather go do this. But the reality is there are 3.44 billion people on this planet who don't get that choice. They've never heard. And those are considered unreached people groups. The green, y'all can see that's where we live. So we are considered, um, so what was the label? Basically there's an established significant church presence in the green areas. So there are believers and there are churches there where you have an opportunity uh, to hear the gospel. And you can see the yellow up there in, in Russia and beyond. That means there are people in those areas that are, is a Christian presence sharing the gospel, but it's, but it's minimal. And so our challenge is, as we think about going to the nations, it's, I mean, when I hear that number, I just go, how do we reach 3.44 billion people? How? Well, Baptist churches throughout the years, we have a thing called the cooperative program. And that's where we give a portion, a percentage of the tithes and offerings that North Orange Baptist Church gives. When you place your donation in our, our offering boxes or you give online, a percentage of that goes to the cooperative program. And part of that gift stays in the state of Texas. And that goes to help uh, do missions in this state. It goes to help with Texas Baptist Disaster Relief, what Ricky Parker and so many of our guys do. There's 
different things that those monies fund in the state of Texas. It also goes on to our national convention, which then a portion of that money goes to international missions and North American missions. And so whatever you give, a portion of that goes to that cause. And then also throughout the year, we give to three different special mission offerings. So what's the one at Easter? Annie Armstrong. You're going, have we paid her off yet? No. Uh, so Annie Armstrong was a missionary, and, uh, and she is basically, we give every Easter time, and all the monies that are given to that offering go to support the evangelistic work in North America. And so part of that other percentage given we talked about covers overhead cost, but all this money goes to helping share the gospel in North America. In September, we give to what's called the Mary Hill Davis Offering. And that money goes to the state of Texas. How do we share Jesus in the state of Texas? And then at Christmas, it's our favorite, Lottie Moon. So y'all know this. All the money that we give to Lottie Moon Christmas Offering goes to sharing the gospel uh, in all these red and yellow areas that you're looking here on the map and beyond. And so part of what we do as the Southern Baptist Church is we give to missions. We have a history of giving, and that is needed and good. But that's not all we need to do. So the question is, is how do we go and make disciples of all nations? Giving is part of it. But the other question is we don't need to let that be all that we do, but to ask those questions of how can I do that? So some of you are going, well, I'm too young. I can't go do this. Well, the way you can do it, like I said, there are international students that live here on your college campuses, at your high schools and your neighborhoods. We can go to the nations just here by learning about what their religious belief system is. Like, what do you believe and why? My aunt, Aunt Nong, she may be watching this morning. She's a Buddhist. She grew up in Thailand. And so that's the world religion that she believes and embraces. Uh, as you talk to your neighbors and friends, they might have another belief system that is different. Learn about them. Ask questions. Go to the nations. Some of you are going, I'm too old. Could you, instead of this year going on an Alaskan cruise or going to the mountains or going to see your grandkids, what if you went, I want to go on a mission trip? You could do that. You could go, and there's a thousand opportunities out there. And if you don't know what that is, come to me. We'll figure it out together. But if God's telling you to go, we want to go to the nations. We want to go pray. We want to go and, and do what we can do to share uh, the gospel, whether it's here or abroad. And I want to encourage you to look at the gospel, uh, the joshuaproject.net. There are different people groups that you can pray for every day. There are tons of resources on this site to inform you and me of how we can make a difference in making disciples of the nations. Which leads us to the last two commands as we're running out of time. We are to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is not private. It is very public. You don't sneak into the kingdom of God. But some of us like, ah, I'm following Jesus. Do I really have to be baptized? I was sharing with our life group class this morning as I was growing up, I didn't grow up in church and I had a friend, John, who went to the Methodist church. And my friend, Jason, went to the Baptist church. And I like the sprinkling thing better. Because I'm like, you don't have to get wet. You don't have to change clothes. That's just easy. And I'm like, oh, that other thing, just looked, it looked weird to me. And that was from an outsider. But when I met Jesus at a crusade at this Baptist church, it wasn't an issue of the how. It was, I need to be obedient. And so following Jesus it's about following him and being a disciple. And part of that is this very public uh, symbol of, of life and death and, and this resurrection as we as Christ followers follow this triune God. And then we are commanded ah, this, this last part to teach them to obey everything I have commanded. Teaching is easy, right? Right? No? One of my favorite, yes, it's not. One of the favorite comments, not real favorite, Morgan made a comment this past year. She's in her second year of teaching. And what's the, the dreaded test that all students have to take? The star test. And so I remember last year, Morgan, she's having to teach, you know, her, her content area. And at the very end, they take the star test. And 
what they put on the star test, is that a reflection of what they learned? Yes and no. Some of us like, hey, they, they studied, they tried to, to put out. Some of them went, oh, I wonder if I could draw some pretty star figures with the little dots. And so you can teach somebody, but just because you teach them doesn't mean they're going to obey it or do it. My dad taught me to turn off the lights when I left a room. Sometimes I do. I think about it. He taught me to make my bed. I don't ever make my bed. Michelle loves to make the bed. It's awesome. I'm just, it's, yeah, my dad, he was in the military. You made your bed, and I, I, I did not do well at obeying what my daddy taught me. Sorry, Dad. Um, but in life, just because when we teach, um, the hard part is obeying. I mean, we can teach things. We can know what the commands are. I mean, we have this book, and we read it, and we read it, and we study it. We can even quote it. But the obeying part is the hard part. Going making disciples. And so the question we have to, to wrestle with is when we hear that statement, um, is are, are we doing it? It's like we know that we're supposed to sing, but do we have a good voice? Eh, Lord says, make a joyful noise. Sometimes when I'm around you, I can't hear you singing. That means you're not singing because I, I always think about, man, I'm so loud. I know the person in front of me, they, they have to hear me. And that sometimes we do that, that makes us not want to sing. But but we also, we know that we're supposed to give. Well, I can't afford to give. I mean, trust God. God is going to, to show you what you're supposed to give to him, and he'll take care of the rest. We know we're supposed to go. We just read that. That is a command. Yet we don't go because we say, I'm, I'm just a student. I can't go, or I've got a job, or I have a family that lives here. The biggest deterrent to students going on mission is moms and dads who say, baby, don't leave me. You go take care of me. I mean, we, but the reality is if God is calling you to go, I mean, I love my three girls. I want them here as long as they want to stay here. But my hope and prayer is that if God calls them to go. They will. We know that we're supposed to make disciples. But making disciples takes commitment and hard work and intentionality. Today, you can go start making disciples in a small way by telling somebody close to you what God taught you today. That's making a disciple. It's like, hey, this is what God taught me today. Go share that with a friend. And then put them on the spot and say, hey, what is God teaching you? So what would, what would you say to me right now if I was to walk down and say, hey, what's God teaching you today? As the sweat rolls down your body, you would go, oh, please, please, Rusty, don't come and ask me that question. But so the other questions around that too is that the question of who, is, who are you discipling? Who are you being intentional with? Who is discipling you? The good news is, is we don't have to do this alone because that last verse says, Surely I'm with you always until the very end of the age. We don't have to do this alone. This is not a test that we can't pass. I mean, God has given us everything. He's given us himself. And so this going, making disciples of all the nations, baptizing, teaching them to obey, this is easy because we don't have to do it alone. If our worship team would come up here and join me at this time. Jesus has given himself, he's given us the authority to go and make disciples of the nations. And I pray today that we would ask that question of where do we need to go this week? Where does Rusty need to go this week to, to go and make disciples of the nations? And also answer the question of who. Who is Jesus calling you to go talk to? We always say, well, he's not. It's not a question of if. The question is who and where. And if we ask that question each week, we get up every morning and say, thank you, God, for the breath that you put in my lungs. I worship you. I can't wait to see what you're going to do today in my life. Who do you want me to go talk to? Where do you want me to go? I mean, we know what we're supposed to do is to go and make disciples of the nations. And it starts with every one of us. If all 100 plus 
people in this room went and told somebody today about Jesus, what would the world look like? What would Orange, Texas look like if we did that?